following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. The book that changed the world. Romans is the book that changed the world. It's a powerful book. It's a profound book. There have been many revivals that got kick-started when people came to a fresh understanding of the book of Romans. It's really amazing. Uh, we're going through the book of Romans right now. We're learning a bunch of cool stuff. And uh, I want to start out with the illustration. If any of you guys have uh, noticed, when you go to cash a check at the bank, have you ever noticed how the teller can just rifle through that money so fast? Is that like weird to you guys or is it just me? I mean, they're like, brrr, like a little machine guy. I sit there going, how do they do that? I mean, I would not be able to do that in a million years, but they, they can rifle through. Uh, for me, it's dollar bills, not like $100 bills. But they're going, brrr, they're like flying through them. And I'm like, that's pretty amazing. What's amazing about it is they go through thousands of dollars every day, these tellers counting money, and they know how to pick out a counterfeit. That's what's amazing. How you can be rifling through that much money that fast and be able to pick out a counterfeit. What's more interesting is when they teach them to be a bank teller and they train them, they actually don't use counterfeits. Isn't that interesting? They use the real deal. They use the real thing. And they realize that if tellers handle the real thing all day long, the second they pick up a counterfeit, they'll know without even looking at it if they're handling the real thing all, all day long. I'd say it's somewhat true in our faith that when we're in and around the real thing, in fact, Jesus is the real thing. I think we have a graphic for that. Uh, we're talking about the real deal today. And uh, when we're in and around the real thing, the real deal, you can tell what's not the real deal. And I think what people are looking for in life, in the Christian faith, is the real deal. Would you agree with me? They're just looking for the real deal. They're not looking for perfect people because no one's perfect. We all fall short. In fact, Romans sets up that thesis early on. There's no one perfect. But they are looking for the real deal. People are looking for people that had a genuine encounter with the resurrected Jesus who changes people. And although they're not perfect, their direction is different and their commitment is different. And the love and the power in their life from God through them is evident. And they're like, yep, they're the real deal. And I want to look, us to look at this passage today from the context of you and I being the real deal. Now, it's a snapshot of the church uh, the early church, the church in Rome, and what was going on in this particular church is you had Gentile believers and you had Jewish believers. A lot of people, when you ask about the Christian faith, they said, well, wasn't that a Gentile religion? And, and they miss out on the history. No, it was a straight up Jewish religion. It was the fulfillment of the Jewish religion and all, many of the, all of the earliest believers were all Jewish. And so the Gentiles later came along and started to get grafted in in the first, you know, 50, 100 years. But what you end up having uh, in this dichotomy of the early church is you have Jewish believers who technically know a lot more. I mean, they know way more about the Old Testament. They know the law. They've got a history with God. They know all about uh, Adonai, Elohim, El, you know, El Shaddai, the names of God. They know about him. The Gentiles don't know much, but they learned about Jesus and they're eager to learn. The problem was the Jews in this situation felt that they had boasting rights. They knew more about religion. They knew more about the law. And they were suggesting that the Gentiles start getting more religious. They start getting more uh, legalistic in their approach. If you really want to know the full faith, this is what it's going to take. And they started to put a load on some of the earlier believers. We see this coming up in some of Paul's letters. Comes up in Galatians. Comes up a few places. But this is what's going on. Paul knows that God's not trying to change people from the outside. Paul knows God's trying to change people from the inside. So Paul's writing this letter and he addresses this issue. There's a theme going on. And uh, last week we looked at it from the standpoint of being judgmental, how people are sometimes judgmental even among believers. And Paul's like, hey, be careful. And today he's moving on with another theme. My hope and prayer is that when we look at some of these themes, we look at them in our own lives as well. And that we check ourselves along the way. And we, we let God give us a tune-up along the way so that you and I can be the real deal. Again, not perfect people, but the real deal. So when your friends, family, neighbors, uh, people in the workplace see you, run into you, have exchanges with you, they're like, you know what? They're the real deal. No, they're not perfect, but they're the real deal. That's what we want, guys. We want to be the real deal in the faith. And uh, so looking at this passage, and by the way, 
if we're not the real deal, um, we might fake it for a while because people try real hard uh, to present ourselves. We do. We try to present ourselves as together spiritually. I think that's the nature of most people. But it's only a matter of time, I think, before people see whether you and I are the real deal or not. It's, it's, uh, it's a recognizable attribute. So uh, let's look at this, if we can, in sections. And um, we're going to start in verse 17 because that's where we left off. Uh, I will say regarding um, being religious and being relational with God, they're two different things. In fact, Jesus clashed with the Pharisees more on this topic than virtually any topic in the Bible. He clashed with, are you genuine with your own condition and your understanding of God? Or are you religious, legalistic, and inflict that on other people? That's what the Pharisees did. Jesus had a big problem with those folks. In fact, when you look at Jesus' encounters with people throughout the New Testament, um, he was kind and gracious to anyone. It could be, you know, the woman caught in the act of adultery. He's like, ma'am, I don't condemn you. Just turn and sin no more. He was kind and gracious with anybody, no matter who they were, what they were doing, drunkards, tax collectors, everyone. It's okay, you know, I don't condemn you. Just turn, though, and, and sin no more. But when it came to these Pharisees, Jesus had some words for them. They were religious. They were legalistic. And I, we see a little, uh, a little tension here uh, between being religious and relational. So G, uh, Paul in this letter to the Romans, we're going to start in verse 17, he starts breaking it down in a few sections. I would suggest this was happening in the church of Rome. These were Christians. It can happen among us as well. So let's look at this through the perspective of checking ourselves as we go through this. Starts out in verse 17 and he says, Now, you, if you call yourself a Jew, and if you rely on the law, and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will, and approve what is superior because you are instructed by the law. If you're convinced that you're a guide for the blind and a light for those who are in dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have the law, the embodiment of knowledge of truth. He's basically starting out here, he's kind of hyperbole, but he's telling these guys, look, if you are the ultimate know-it-alls, if you have this background of knowledge, if you are superior in your ability to instruct people, if you've got all this experience with God, if you've been, we can even say, a believer for 10, 15, 20 years, if you've learned more about the Bible, if you're further down the road in the faith than those around you, this is what he's talking about, he's like, be careful, be careful. Uh, these guys were apparently boasting about their spirituality. They were boasting of their experiences. They were boasting of their accomplishments. Uh, and Paul is basically saying, hey, be careful about that. We may have a heritage in the faith. Some may know more about the word. Some may have an understanding of God's will and, and maybe feel like we are, in fact, sometimes a guide to others. But Paul is like, be careful on what you boast about. And there's this theme going on in Romans, and he's going to get to it here uh, in a minute, but uh, just to build on this theme, Jesus says in Luke chapter 18, he says, uh, excuse me, the gospel of Luke says, the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. Snapshot in the temple, if you remember. It's a Pharisee in the temple. Jesus is watching. The apostles are watching. And the Pharisee stands up. He prayed about himself before God. And he's like, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other men here. I'm not robbers and evildoers and adulterers like those or even like this tax collector, thank you, God, that I'm not like them. And Jesus is watching this. He's like, seriously? <laughs> is that a prayer? Is that the prayer of a, an experienced believer? Is that the prayer of someone with maturity in the faith? And Jesus goes on to say that those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. There's a profound reality in the faith when it comes to our faith and being the real deal that pride is one of the biggest things that gets in the way. The Bible says pride comes before the fall. And there's something about recognizing our ongoing need for a savior. Uh, the book of Romans is building a theme right here and he's been leading up to it that we're all sinners that need a savior. You, me, every day I'm still a sinner that needs a savior and hopefully you would admit the same thing. But something happens along the way sometimes when people have experience in the faith and they start to learn more and grow and get more mature Sometimes they forget that they're a sinner. Maybe they think they're not a sinner anymore. Maybe they think they're beyond that. And what happens is they tend to elevate themselves above this. This pride gets in. And we, we too, guys, can become a little like these Pharisees. 
if we were honest with ourselves, we too can do things like what these guys are doing. Um, God does not praise those who praise themselves. He doesn't operate that way. In fact, it says, First Peter, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And Romans 12, 3, I love what this says. It says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Get a visual on that one, sober judgment. Some people think of themselves like, you know, somebody who had too many drinks. They can't really land really well on things, on topics, on issues. Peter is saying, you know, anybody who thinks of themselves too highly, it's like someone who's had a few too many. They, they're not sober. They don't even understand where they're thinking of themselves. He's saying, think of yourself soberly. And soberly is, recognize we're all sinners that need a savior. That's the snapshot. Last week we said that the ground at the cross is level. The ground at the cross is level for you, for me, for anyone. If someone's been in the faith 40 years and they got a you know, doctorate in divinities, great. Somebody's been a pastor for 50 years and evangelist. Somebody's new in the faith one week. Guess what? The ground is level at the cross. That is the paradox of the God's kingdom. It's an amazing thing. It's a beautiful thing, really, when you come to terms with it. There's no place for pride in the kingdom of God. That's what drives the heart of a Pharisee in this case, uh, is this heart of pride that was elevated. To be fair, there were many Pharisees in the first century that were humble enough to recognize the Savior, and there were Pharisees that became part of the early church. Yet, yet, there were others that still felt superior and looked down on and critiqued and judged. And this is what this passage is about. Um, there's a great scripture. If you struggle with this or I think if you want to land in your life, in your Christian faith, if you want to land in a place where you don't have to really deal with this aspect again, here's a great one I recommend to you. Isaiah 51.1. This is a scripture I held on to early on. I still recall this scripture. The thing about scripture is when you get a scripture in your heart, you can put it on instant recall. And that's the thing about hiding the word in your heart. This one says, forget not the quarry from which you were dug and the rock from which you were hewn. What that means quite simply is if we were honest with ourselves, God pulled us out of a rock pile, folks. You might not remember that or think that, but he did. He pulled us out of a rock pile and he's chiseling us and he's making us into a masterpiece, his poema, the Bible says, God's workmanship. He's kind of refining us like a diamond, chiseling away, polishing, but he dug us from the bottom of a, a quarry. That's the concept in the spiritual realm. When you look at the human condition, God pulled you and I, if Jesus is your Lord this morning, he pulled you and I from a rock quarry and we can't forget that. And as long as you remember to forget not the quarry from which you were dug and the rock from which you were being chiseled from, we tend to say, wow, God, your grace is amazing. And we sing songs like we sung earlier this morning, Amazing Grace. We sing it like we mean it because we're like, God, no, I get it. Your grace is amazing. What happens, guys, is when we forget that we're from a rock quarry and we were being chiseled and we're a work in progress, we actually think that we have attained and we do deserve, and we have learned more, and we've become more mature in the faith. And when we start to think this way, we kind of look at ourselves more highly than we ought, and we don't have really sober judgment. I believe that's part of what was going on in the Roman church. Never forget that any progress we've made has strictly been by his grace. Do you guys agree with that? It's by his grace. When you know that, you, you, you look at somebody who's totally lost and away from Jesus, you look at them totally differently. You look at them with, with compassion, not critique. You look at where you are and say, thank you. All I gotta say is thank you. Uh, I'm not who I used to be, but I'm not, I'm not who I'm gonna be either. I'm a work in progress, but thank you for your grace. If we remember this, but if we don't, we too can tend to be prideful and look down and assume these other things, boasting about our progress. This has been a presentation of Valley Metro Church. To hear more messages or to support future podcasts, please visit valleymetrochurch.com.